Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to BrainMap. This seminar series is co-sponsored by the P41 funded Center for Mesoscale Mapping housed in the Martino Center. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Noam Ben Eliezer. Dr. Ben Eliezer received his Bachelor of Science in Physics and Computer Science and Masters in Physics Science from Tel Aviv University, both with distinction. He received his PhD from the Weizmann Institute of Science, Israel, in 2010, mentored by Lucio Friedman. He then performed a postdoc fellowship at the Department of Radiology at NYU under the mentoring of Professor Daniel Sodikson. He is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Biomedical Engineering in the Sagol School of Neuroscience at Tel Aviv University, Israel, as well as an adjunct assistant professor at the Center for Advanced Imaging Innovation and Research at NYU. He received several distinction and honors, including cover images at MRI-related journals and the Distinguished Reviewer Award from MRM. His main research objective is to characterize the Milo architecture of the central nervous system in order to gain more insights into the pathophysiology of multiple sclerosis and other demyelinating disease. I would just like to remind the audience to please address any question you have using the Q&A box or just raise your virtual hand. Dr. Ben Eliezer, thank you very much for coming here today. The virtual stage is all yours. Thank you all. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Um, the talk um, is planned to around uh, 40, 45 minutes. And I would like to encourage you to ask questions uh, during the talk. Uh, of course, you can keep them also to the end of the talk. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is some methodological work that, that I've been doing in my lab in the last uh, couple of years, um, trying to look beyond the voxel level. Uh, this is done using multi-component fitting. And the main application, is, as Or mentioned, is, is myelin mapping, although there are many different kinds of applications for, for this uh, technique. So I always like to start with some kind of a historical overview. And you can see here uh, Raymond the Median, uh, um, an underappreciated, in a sense, uh, scientist. I'm saying underappreciated because, uh, unfortunately, he didn't win the Nobel Prize um, together with Lauterbur and uh, Mansfield. And you can see here, and I, I encourage you to take a look at uh, this news clip, Downstate Reporter from 1971, uh, where he, he already um, uh, predicted and claimed that MRI and NMR would be used to detect uh, cancerous lesions in the, in the body. Um, jumping 40 years later, or 50 years later, here to 2021, we have uh, made a huge advancements in the field of magnetic resonance. And it's a big question, what will happen in the next years? I mean, this is a modality that keeps changing and evolving and uh, becoming more and more diverse. And one of my goals is to look at MRI, uh, not just as a high-end camera, but uh, trying to convert it or, or use it as a measuring device. And, and this relates, this measuring device relates to uh, what's called quantitative MRI. Um, I will say a few words about what is quantitative MRI in this talk and about sub-voxel modeling. And then um, I'll talk about uh, multi-component mapping of T2 relaxation times, uh, which is the basis for sub-voxel imaging. Uh, this will be preceded by single T2 mapping because uh, you cannot uh, map uh, multiple components without being able to accurately map one component. Uh, I will show you validation against ground truth, uh, which is not a trivial uh, task uh, because ground truth is, is uh, hard to uh, implement or hard to achieve um, um, in, in MRI in many applications. And then I'll show a couple of uh, uh, applications looking at uh, uh, myelin content in the uh, mouse model of uh, multiple sclerosis and preliminary results of looking at mild content in the brain of, human, of humans. So qualitative versus quantitative. Uh, 
qualitative MRI is most of the MRI we see today. I'm not showing here brain examples, but there are, of course, so many different brain examples. Uh, on the other hand, quantitative MRI, numeric, uh, like flow imaging, electric property mapping, tractography, functional MRI, are being uh, investigated a lot, uh, looked at a lot, but um, most of the clinical use of MRI does not use quantitative imaging. And the reason is, of course, historic, and, and there, is, there are some challenges in quantitative MRI. Um, and what, what is quantitative MRI, in a sense, is when we measure the actual parameter values rather than generating contrast-weighted images. Here you can see a, a contrast-weighted, a T2-weighted image, where longer relaxation times are brighter and shorter relaxation times are darker. And this is a qualitative image. Uh, in order to map the actual T2 values here, uh, we would need more time and we would need accurate signal model. But if we are able to, to map the actual T2 values, uh, there are three main advantages that, uh, that we will gain. First of all is flexibility. Once we have the T2 value, we can generate any level of contrast offline. So in this example, we can take the T2 and create a proton density weighted images or heavily T2-weighted images from a single T2 map. The second advantage is sensitivity. When we measure an actual parameter value, uh, and let's say we have a measurement error of two or 3%, that means that anything above, two or any uh, effect that is above two or 3% would be detectable by MRI. Uh, visually, on the other hand, uh, we would need a much larger change in order to uh, see uh, differences. Here, the differences between these images are uh, 10 or 20% uh, change in T2 values. So um, it is known and it is uh, uh, um, possible to gain higher sensitivity by measuring uh, the actual values. And third, and no less important, is scalability. If we can measure the true values of a certain parameter, uh, ground truth value, then it would be invariant to scanners, to scan settings, to MRI centers. And this opens up the possibility to, to run longitudinal studies, even though our software version changed, or multi-center studies, where we have different vendors, different MRI scanners at different centers. Uh, and this scalability is something that really limits uh, MRI today because um, contrast-weighted images would not always come out the same on different scanners. Now, complementing QMRI or quantitative MRI is sub-voxel modeling. Uh, in this talk, I will uh, focus on, on myelinated axons as an example. And myelinated axons of the white matter are uh, thought to contain three main uh, uh, water pools. Uh, extracellular water pool, intracellular water pool, and water that resides between the myelin sheets. Um, the reason that we relate white matter as having three water pools is just because it is an ordered tissue. It has an internal microscopic order. Um, many tissues don't have that, but when we do have, when we do have uh, internal order, we can model the tissue uh, to have several compartments. And the picture, of course, becomes very complicated because now every compartment has its own T2 value, has its own T2 star value. There's magnetization transfer between the cell membranes and the water pools. There's diffusion to take into account or chemical exchange. So all of these come into effect and need to be considered when looking at subvoxel models. And the question that, that I'm asking myself these days and in the last few years is, can we, can we map myelin content, uh, which is microscopic feature of the, of the tissue using ma macroscopic measurements, millimetric measurements? And, and the main tool to do that is to look at these three water compartments, the three water pools, and assume that the signal that we acquire, this green signal you see here in green, which decays in time, this is a T2 decay curve, 
is actually composed of two, in this case, two components. Uh, in this example, one relating to intra or extracellular water, which decays slower, and one relates to myelin water, which, which decays faster. Um, okay, and, and again, the basic premise here is that ordered microscopic compartmentation means that we would have multiple or a finite number of T2 compartments. No questions so far, right? Okay. So quantitative T2, QT2, um, I'm starting with single T2 mapping. And single T2 mapping is not as easy to map as, as you would think. Um, theoretically, T2 decay uh, can be measured using a spin echo experiment or a multi-spin echo experiment. And theoretically, it would decay exponentially. But a single spin echo experiment can take 50 minutes or even an hour and a half, depending on the spatial resolution you want. I managed to, to run a spin echo experiment in 20 minutes, but it was a very poor resolution uh, scan. If we use a multi spin echo or multi echo spin echo protocol, which takes about five minutes, the decay curve does no longer uh, look exponential. It does not decay exponentially, but on the other hand, it decays along this, what I call echo modulation curve. It starts out by rising and then modulating up and down, decaying slowly. And, and this, is, this effect happens because of stimulated echoes and indirect echoes. I won't go too much into the spin physics here, but, but believe me that this is how it looks like. And the reason is that the 180 pulses, the refocusing pulses that are applied between each and every echo here, the refocusing pulses are actually not 180 pulses. We would want them to be 180 pulses, but on a multi-slice experiment, we would have a non-rectangular slice profile. The edges of the slice uh, contains refocusing flip angles from zero to 180. There are inhomogeneities of the main magnetic field, B0, or the transmit magnetic field, B1. Sometimes the refocusing flip angle is not 180 because this is what the scanner, the, the user prescribes because of SAR. Uh, and there are also uh, diffusion effects, which uh, have a um, very significant influence uh, when you use preclinical scanners. Uh, if you're interested in preclinical imaging, uh, I would be happy to, to talk to you after the talk. And some residual T1 relaxation effects. And all of these effects cause um, erroneous T2 values if you would use exponential fitting. And these, this bias in T2 values when using exponential fitting is not small. It can be tens of percent, or it can be even 100 or 150% depending on the T2 value that you're measuring and depending on the refocusing flip angle that you use. So uh, to, give you, to give you an idea of the numbers, uh, here, here you see uh, values that were measured for five brain regions, the gene of corpus callosum, the splenium, caudate nucleus, uh, an area in the frontal white matter and the periventricular white matter. And you can see that uh, exponential fit produces longer T2 values with a higher standard deviation. And the most important thing to see here is that the coefficient of variation is larger. And that means that by using the wrong signal model, the spread of values does not scale as the baseline of the values. So if we're overestimating the T2 value by a factor of 1.4 or 1.5 or a factor of two, the standard deviation would scale more than the uh, bias in the basis T2 value. And, and that means that we will have a lower chance of detecting uh, changes in the tissue. And another important thing to remember is that the distortion not only depends on the T2 value and on the B1 uh, or the refocusing flip angle that we choose, it also depends on the type of scanner. It depends on the echo time that you use. It depends on the bandwidth. It depends on the slice thickness. So this creates a lot of variability when mapping T2 value and requires uh, a signal model that is not exponential. Uh, this is the EMC echo modulation curve, a signal model that is based on, uh, I'm sorry, 
simulating block equations. So we take the full block equations and, and simulate them on a computer with a specific T2 value uh, in mind. The simulations um, take into account the actual pulse sequence scheme from the scanner, exactly as it was implemented, including the parameter values. It produces through a propagator, it produces an echo modulation curve for this T2 value. And this is the, in a sense, uh, uh, practical or uh, the, what we expect to see in experiment, the echo modulation curve we expect to see from experimental data. Now, full 3D simulations of a pulse sequence are very, very time consuming. They can take days to weeks. And one of the main things to do uh, in order to, to uh, uh, be able to simulate this is to reduce dimensionality. Instead of uh, simulating along three dimensions and time, we're simulating only along the third slice dimension and time. And the reason we can do that is the same reason that um, we get this echo modulation curve and not exponential fit. What do I mean? Uh, we know that the slices are not rectangular. Uh, we know that the flip angles are not 180. Uh, I can also tell you that the slice edges uh, comprise as much as 50% uh, of the slice thickness themselves. But because all these effects are caused because of uh, um, inaccuracies along the slice dimension and not along the X or Y, the readout or phase encode, it's possible to reduce the dimensionality and simulate only along uh, uh, one, one dimension. And here you can see an example of, of a few uh, echo modulation curves for different T2 values. You see uh, how they behave. And what we do in order to map uh, T2 values experimentally is create a dictionary, a dictionary of echo modulation curves, and then match uh, between the experimental signal and the dictionary uh, because we're using a multi-echo spin echo protocol, the encoding quality is very uh, high. It is important to remember if we would try to use a, a gradient echo experiment, an SSFP-based experiment uh, protocol, it wouldn't have enough sensitivity, enough uh, um, sensitivity to T2 values to be able to differentiate every millisecond, for example. So this, this matching, uh, works so well because we're using a multi echo spin echo experiment, which is sensitive to T2 and sensitive to B1 plus, again, because we're using so many RF pulses. So we have this uh, technique that can uh, map T2 values and I'm showing you uh, uh, a quick example of, of running a single spin echo experiment for 22 minutes. Uh, you get a T2 map that decays exponentially because this is not a multi echo. Uh, experiment. And if we use a multi-echo experiment and use exponential fit, you get a biased T2 map. If you use an ENC fit, you get the uh, true values. Uh, and this can be applied uh, for Cartesian or for radial uh, uh, scans. Um, I also did, uh, back in the days, uh, a, lot of, a lot of validations for this technique. Uh, here on the left, you can see uh, reproducibility, where um, I ran either 24 scans on a brain or, or uh, I think 20 scans on the hip um, uh, on different scanners with different scan settings to, to estimate inter-scanner variability and intra-scanner variability. Uh, and the uh, values are, are, are pretty low. Um, we compared, I compared the uh, multi-spin echo to a single spin echo experiment. And you can see how the error reduces to one and a half uh, percent. And now that we have good reproducibility or we know what is re the reproducibility of this technique and we know what is the accuracy, we can continue to use this tool and, and we've been using it for to study many, many uh, different pathologies uh, neuro, neuro, uh, relating to, to brain disorders, relating to muscular dystrophies, to uh, musculoskeletal uh, uh, disorders and, and, and more. So this was um, the part where I was explaining 
how we map single T2 values. And now let's shift gears and move to the uh, main course, which is multi-component T2 uh, fitting. And the main goal uh, that we had in mind uh, was to quantify myelin content uh, in vivo. And multi-component T2 means, as I said before, that we have different water pools. Here again, we can see the example of a myelinated axon. If we can spread this information of short and long T2 along a T2 spectrum, we would have a long T2, a peak for the long T2 and a peak for the short T2 values. And then we can take the relative fraction of the uh, short T2 peak and get a myelin water fraction. Again, this is an indirect way of quantifying myelin. Indirect because we're not looking at the actual protons that reside on the myelin molecules or uh, on the membrane. We're looking at the water pool. So there are some disadvantages to uh, looking at it indirectly, but this is one of the best ways that we have today. Um, I, I can mention uh, a work an impressive work that I remember by Mark Doze, who uh, managed to write a very fast imaging protocol on a clinical scanner and, and look at the actual uh, protons on the myelin, but this is uh, less, less realistic in clinical routine. So this is, this is what's called myelin water imaging and myelin water fraction map. And the, the basis of looking at it mathematically is that the signal in time is a, a sum of, of exponents or echomodulation curves, each one having its own weight. And when we uh, get the spectrum, we get the myelin water fraction. And this process is very, very challenging. It's very challenging because it is very ill-posed mathematically. Even if you run simulations of exponential of a series of exponentials, one, two, or three exponential, and you want to try and invert your signal, what's called an inverse Laplace transform or ILT, uh, at, at ideal conditions, it wouldn't give you, uh, uh, it wouldn't produce reliable or stable results. Uh, we don't always know, or I would switch the order of the words, we, we, we never know. Uh, uh, what, what is the number of components that exists uh, at every voxel. It might be one component, two or three, or even more. And the process itself of, of inverting this, this problem is very sensitive to noise. Um, so we found uh, a slightly different way of looking at the problem, okay? And I'll start first by, by um, describing the problem as uh, the signal in time being equal to a sum of echomodulation curves, each one weighted uh, differently. Uh, ETL is the echo train length, usually around 15 to 25 echoes. The weights are between zero and one. And we can express this, this problem as uh, in a matrix form. And as I told you, this matrix form is very, very ill-posed. We want to find what is W. We want to find what is the, the weight of every component. And this is very challenging computationally. Um, the, the number of possible multi-component combinations is very, very large. Uh, we use combinatorics to, to calculate it. Take, for example, uh, this uh, dictionary of single T2 values. I can take any single T2 value or two T2 values or three EMCs, echomodulation curves, and, and create a signal. So the, the eventual number of MCT2 uh, combination uh, is the sum of one component numbers uh, combination, two components, and three components. Uh, and W is the number of weight values we're using usually around 50, every 2%. Uh, this is a, a relatively uh, nice uh, 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 number, uh, which is also feasible from a computational point of view. And now I, I come to the, the main part 
of, of the algorithm and how uh, I'm suggesting to overcome the ill posedness of the problem. So we, we start by calling these MCT2 combinations motifs. Motifs in a sense, this is a motif of the sample, motif of, of, our, of tissue. Now, if we take around 64 T2 values and around 50 fraction values, we would get millions of different MCT2 motifs that can fit our experimental signal. How could we choose one which fit, fits most to our signal? So this is uh, uh, not really uh, feasible. And the approach that, that we're taking is what's called a global approach. The global approach means that I start by looking at all these millions of MCT2 motifs and uh, correlating each and every motif to all the voxels that I have in my tissue. So let's choose a segment of the tissue, let's say part of the white matter, like the corpus callosum, and I will take each and every element, uh, MCT2 motif, and find out how much does it match to each of the voxels that I have. Each motif thus receives a score, and the score reflects the goodness of fit with the experimental data. Now, the score can be high if the motif fits very well a very small number of voxels, or it can be high if it fits relatively well a large number of voxels. And I will say a few words on how do we uh, calculate this score later, but now I have a score that tells me how much does each MCT2 motif matches the actual data that I'm looking at. This is why I call it a data-driven approach. And so based on these scores, I can now take only a subset of these MCT2 motifs, only a subset uh, around 50, and, and these motifs would be used to describe the signal instead of the previous motifs that were based on a single T2 value. So I'm not going to take uh, uh, a triplet of single T2 values, but from now on, I'm going to uh, consider um, a subset of an MCT2 dictionary. I'm going to consider motifs which are uh, already multi-component. So before I showed you that the signaling time is a sum over uh, different T2 values, each one with its own, Wait, and now I'm switching. Instead of looking at EMCs, which are single P2, I'm looking at EMC, which are motifs, which I already know have a very good chance of describing my, my uh, uh, sample. There is another basic assumption here is that when I take um, specific regions in the brain, in the white matter, and I'm not taking the entire white matter as a whole, um, there is an assumption that there would be a limited number of MCT2 motifs there. And this is the only assumption that we're making, that there is a limited number. And by using these statistical correlation, these global statistical cor correlations, we identify a set of motifs, and then we can write our problem again in a matrix form, add regularization like Tikhonov that promotes convergence, L1 that uh, favors a sparse solution, and solve this minimization problem for each and every voxel in our sample. So this, this uh, uh, cost function contains in E, in e uh, a dictionary of NCT2 motifs. Now, Identifying the correct motifs is, is also uh, quite a process. Uh, I told you that we start by looking at the series of MCT2 motifs, millions of them, and series of EMC signals, which are also MCT2 signals. They, each signal contains multiple components. We calculate an element to voxel probability score. 
we normalize the probability scores and then we raise them to a power of beta, which is somewhere around uh, 10 to 1,000. And this would favor motifs with very high scores, either because they match a small number of uh, voxels, even if they may match a small number of voxels. After raising to the power of beta these scores that are between zero and one, we sum the score of every dictionary element across all voxels in our sample. And now we can get the, we, we make use, we utilize the glo globality of this technique. We sum over the entire segment. And now uh, this process favors uh, motifs that have a around 50 uh, NCT2 motifs, um, each one uh, having the best uh, global probability score. Questions? Okay, so let's take a look at uh, uh, a few results. Um, here you can see uh, numerical simulations, numerical simulations. Uh, this is a Shep Logan Phantom, each color describes or uh, um, uh, emulates a different type of tissue. The tissues could have uh, different levels of myelin uh, or different levels of extra, intra extracellular water. And there is also uh, a few, uh, these purple tissues that uh, describe lesions where we have only 10 T2 values. The simulations were run on either single component, two compartment, or three compartments. Um, and uh, up to an SNR of 60, there was a perfect fit. A perfect fit, the algorithm um, um, identified automatically the number of components, either one, two, or three. We didn't tell it what, what was the number of components. And you can see here the short T2 component, the middle T2 component. Uh, and, and the long T2 component in case of, of uh, here, in case of lesion. So we were, we were encouraged by this uh, uh, numerical simulation. And next was, um, I think, one of the key parts of this research, key parts of this development, which were phantom validations. Um, I know that, that phantom validations are not always considered as, as uh, the best proof of concept. But I think that phantom validations gives you the opportunity to test your uh, system um, in a very effective way. And in this case, we built a very unique phantom. This phantom was very, very small. It was five millimeters by five millimeters. And inside a test tube, we put capillaries that contains uh, water that had different T2 values. In this case, 13 milliseconds and 80 milliseconds, all immersed in a, a, a water pool that had 51 millisecond uh, um, T2 value. At the next stage, we imaged this phantom twice once with high resolution, with an internal uh, in-plane resolution of 78 micrometer. And you can see here, here the images. Every stage of the phantom, while we have only uh, two components, and then we have a third component. This is the myelin. It's dark because it has a short T2 value. And we slowly or gradually increase the amount of capillaries that simulate myelin. And by uh, and next, we imaged the same phantom with a low resolution scan. The low resolution scan had an implant resolution of five millimeters, which means that every voxel, in one voxel, we were able to capture the entire phantom. And by this, we could produce, we produced an experimental signal, which is a true multi-component T2 signal, while we know exactly what was the ground truth of myelin content underlying this uh, MCT2 signal. And the results were uh, very, very encouraging. On the left, you can see the true 
the true uh, fraction of the short T2 component as calculated geometric, geometrically from just looking at the uh, volume, the relative volume of the um, mile in water test tubes. And on the bottom, you can see the fitted values uh, A signal that came from a five millimeter by five millimeter voxel into its different components. Uh, we did the same on a two compartment phantom. As I said before, the algorithm automatically knows or automatically detects the number of components to be two or three. Uh, this was done on a 9.4 Tesla scanner. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, in vivo validation on a mice model. This is a mice that uh, uh, it's called the Coprison model. You uh, allow the mouse to eat. Um, uh, you, you put the mouse on a specific diet that uh, damages the myelin, uh, the myelin tissue, the myelinated tissues in the brain. Uh, you can see here part of the corpus callosum of, of the mouse of a demyelinated case in a control case uh, where there was no demyelination. Um, we had two mice groups and we uh, estimated the myelin content either using immunohistochemistry, uh, histology, or using uh, uh, our algorithm. And you can see here the results. There were two groups, the Cuprizon mice and the control group. And on the bottom, you can see the myelin content as was estimated by histology on the left using the MCT2 algorithm. And there is a very nice correlation between the values. Um, I would say, I would like to reserve, to, to say that I, 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 um, I don't trust these results as much as, much as I trust. So histology changes the tissue. It's not always the, when you label, when you dye the tissue, you don't always get the, the exact same uh, color. Uh, so there is some variability in immunohistochemistry, but, but these are still a very encouraging result. And you can also uh, create myelin water fraction maps in the corpus callosum here overlaid on a T2 weighted uh, image. And you can see the, the large difference between a Cuprizon mouse and a control mouse. Okay. So another uh, preliminary result. Um, uh, here we're looking at different voxels in the white matter of a human uh, scan. Uh, and myelin content. On the bottom, you see the spectrum that, that we get using the uh, MCT2 algorithm. Um, okay. Uh, another thing that we're working on right now, and these are preliminary results, is uh, testing repeatability. Repeatability is very, very important. Uh, here, uh, you can see three different scans of the same subject run consecutively, and we ran the MCT2 algorithm three times. And you can see that um, we still need to, to run some numerical analysis on, on these values, but um, the values are, are more or less repeatable. Um, so this is again, very, very uh, encouraging. You can see that the segments that we choose um, can't be too small and they can't be too large. We want segments where we can assume that there is a limited number of MCT2 motifs that would describe that specific uh, part of the brain or that specific tissue. Um, another thing that is important and I talked about before is SNR. Uh, SNR uh, causes a lot of ambiguity in the fitting uh, of in standard fitting uh, approaches. And we also wanted to improve the SNR in our uh, data. And what we're usually using is um, 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 derived something that we developed uh, for um, theta relaxation um, signals. It's called, uh, it's based on Marchenko Pasteur uh, 
principal component analysis denoising, and we uh, ported uh, this algorithm to uh, Tito relaxation. The basic assumption is that when you the underlying information, the underlying uh, anatomy would not change, whereas the noise pattern would change between echoes. The anatomy would perhaps change its contrast, but not its features. And this is a very, very effective denoising algorithm. You can see here uh, two examples here on the bottom. You can see how uh, uh, the algorithm is, is uh, uh, cleaning a lot of noise around the ventricles. And this four pixel structure, which is real, uh, is, is um, identified as real by the algorithm. This is a um, very high resolution scan. We try to uh, test the, the limitation of the denoising algorithm. And even at very, very low uh, SNR, it performs very well without um, any, any visible loss of, of uh, features. So uh, this is about it. And let me, let me summarize um, the MCT2 algorithm allows us to map subvoxel compartmentation in vivo based on uh, separating the signal into different uh, teeter relaxation times. It is independent of scanner and scan settings because the model itself are, uh, follow the exact pulse sequence scheme and parameter values as they were used on the scanner. It's a bit tedious because you sometimes need to repeat it if you change your parameter set, but it gives you this uh, uh, huge advantage of being uh, invariant to uh, uh, scanners. Uh, reprodu reproducibility tests looks promising, and the clinical application are, are um, I mean, there are so many uh, clinical application of every, every part of the body, uh, ranging from mild water imaging, we're looking at fat infiltration into, uh, into the muscle in uh, neuromuscular diseases and muscular dystrophies. Uh, we're looking at brain lipid content, uh, either in pathological conditions or, or in healthy uh, adults. Um, we, can, uh, we plan to look at accumulation of fat in the liver, uh, fat necrosis in breast tissue, uh, internal composition of cancerous tumors, and, and, and more. Um, I'm emphasizing again the, the gist or the, the main part here of the, of, the, of the approach, the choice to use global statistical correlations. The reason that we use global statistical correlations is because the ill-posedness of deconvolving a signal from a signal, single voxel to several underlying signals. Because of lower scenario, because uh, inherent ambiguity in this multi-parametric space. Imagine that you have three components, three components where we don't know the T2 value of each component and we don't know the fraction of each component. And we have millions of configurations and there are several reports. Um, sometimes, uh, I think that every, every year you see one abstract in the ISMRM uh, showing comparison of myelin water fraction techniques and showing how each one produces a different uh, different values. And to overcome this ambiguity, we harnessed the statistical correlation on a global length scale. Um, there was no a priori assumption of the number of, of components, uh, but there is this important assumption that the number of motifs or the number of MCT2 motifs uh, is, is finite. But we have a finite number. We use 50, uh, between 50 and, and, and 20, and we found that to be uh, quite enough, quite sufficient um, for, for tissues that we looked at in the brain so far. Um, validations were also promising. Um, the problem of, of lack of ground truth, because uh, there is no in vivo gold standard today, so there are contradictory reports. The histology changes the tissue. And our phantom validation, our unique phantom design provided actual ground truth values. 
And this perfect agreement between fitted and ground truth values is, is the thing that I find the most encouraging uh, about this uh, technique. Uh, still, we had nice uh, agreement between histology and, and fitted values. Um, I would also like to say that, that uh, histology is not necessarily linear. It's not that if this brown area is twice as brown, it means that we have twice the myelin contact. So one should regard uh, histology uh, results with some caution, uh, especially if you look at it quantitatively. Ongoing work, there is a lot of ongoing work and a lot of open questions. Um, we need to take into account perhaps intercompartmental exchange. Um, uh, most literature today uh, claim that we are in a slow exchange regime, which means that during the course of one echo train, one echo modulation curve, uh, there is not a lot of exchange. Um, reports uh, state values of around 200 to 500 milliseconds as the mean residence time of, of uh, protons on the myelin uh, uh, water pools, uh, which, is, which is good, but, but this, this assumption needs to be uh, revisited. Um, we're trying to look at joint uh, signal model where we take into account relaxation and diffusion, and we're doing it uh, very, very, uh, we're putting a lot of energy when considering preclinical scanners. Uh, question, is there a reliable way to perform in, in vivo human validation? Could we get some kind of ground truth? Uh, we want to test stability across scan, scan parameters versus the natural intersubject uh, uh, variability to see what is the detect, detection level. And uh, probe myelin content in normal arterial and white matter, I already saw that using quantitative T2, single T2 values, we can detect pathology in normal appearing white matter, even though it's not a visible pathology. A radiologist would say this is a completely healthy uh, uh, tissue, but we can still detect changes in, in small changes in T2 values. Uh, and now we want to apply a multi component uh, uh, analysis to these kind of uh, cases. So um, I'd like to thank my group, which did. <laughs> most of the work and funding agencies. And of course, thank you for, for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben Eliezer, for this great talk. And we now move to the Q&A phase. Uh, so I'd just like to remind everyone, you can just type your questions in the Q&A box or raise your hand. And while people are typing, I'll just ask, you mentioned uh, that you're working with dictionaries of million op combinations and options. I'm wondering how long does it take to reconstruct a human 3D data? Um, one segment that I uh, showed here, around one segment, oh, this is very, one segment takes a few minutes here, but we haven't uh, yet invested any effort in uh, accelerating because since all of this is done offline, uh, we're doing it on a standard uh, PC. Um, so a few minutes for a segment, and I'm guessing that the whole, the entire one ma white matter would take somewhere between uh, half an hour and an hour on a standard PC. Um, I believe that it could be reduced to a few seconds if we implement it on a GPU. Okay. And, and for the first part of the talk, you mentioned the way you compare your experimental data to the dictionary. Is there any particular metric you're using or correlation? Um, I tried several metrics like uh, L2 norm, L1 norm, uh, Frobenius norm. But uh, to be honest, the L2 norm performed uh, slightly better than the rest, and there was not a lot of difference. So the L2 norm difference is, is, is the most effective way. Great. And another thing regarding the ground truth, which is a, a major issue for uh, various fields, uh, the lack of ground truth for the human data. Do you think there's any way you couldn't 
try and correlate the myelin fraction uh, or, or with, with the disease state or any other way to, to circumvent the need to get this information, this actual ground truth? I think, I think that you could get clinically significant values that would be useful for studying diseases even if you get wrong values or biased values. I mean, the fact that they're biased doesn't mean that they're not clinically significant. The fact that if we look here on the difference between uh, uh, healthy and demyelinated brains, you could change the values or bias them, you would still get clinically significant values. The problem is when you move to a different scanner, if you shift to a different scanner, if you want to change your parameter values and compare your data to data that you acquired two years ago with a different echo time, and then you get different values. And this is not something that you would, would want. You would want to be able to compare the values that you're measuring with values that you measured in the past before the scanner uh, had a software upgrade. Or you would want to compare your values with uh, your colleague who works on a GE scanner, because we're doing all this on Brooker scanners, on Siemens scanners, and on GE scanners for now. And this is where getting in values that are invariant to protocol implementation and parameters is, is important. So yeah, you could use biased values to study disease, but there is some disadvantage to it. Great, thank you. And Bruce Jenkins, can you please unmute? Oh yeah, I wanna, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I wanna thank you. This is like the best talk I've ever seen on deconvolving uh, multiple T2 in tissue. And I think I love the data-driven approach and the uh, acknowledgement that it's a very uh, ill-posed uh, problem. So, and, and I think you've gone about solving it in a, in a way that seems very logical and, and, and rational. And so I just had a few questions, like for instance, um, in your phantom experiments, which are very nice, you know, you showed you could reconstruct the ground truth, but of course there, there was no exchange, right? Because those are capillary tubes. And um, I'm just wondering if you've actually tried to do uh, a similar experiment in, tish, in, in other uh, situations where you would have for instance, these also are very um, spatially compartmentalized. And so in, in tissue where you, or, or phantom where you had more mixing, say between compartments and more um, amorphous uh, spatial structures to see how that would might change uh, the, the ability to deconvolve the uh, MCT2. So uh, this is an amazing, a very, very good question. And you're, you're uh, uh, barging into an open door as they say. Um, we're now working on, on phantoms that are built of these filaments like sheets that um, have very small holes in them. And according to the concentration of the holes, the, the density and the size, they um, uh, cause different levels of exchange. So uh, this is a very uh, important point and, and testing different types of exchange levels, different levels of, of molecular exchange between the compartment is, is uh, important. Um, as I said, um, the literature does state that we are in a slow exchange regime, which means that we should be good, but I, I have to admit that I don't really um, consider this as a reliable report. There are, very small number of reports. So running phantom validations with exchange is the next step by all means. And, th and then if you, don't, if you don't mind, just one more quick question. Uh, you know, one thing that's always, I've always wondered about is, um, especially with the, when it comes to the myelin water that people ascribe the myelin water, you know, as being myelin water. But like, for instance, in many tissues, you know, the mitochondrial density in the tissue, the volume of the intracellular volume can be up to 25%. And one would expect the mitochondrion would have very short uh, T2. So I'm wondering, have you ever picked up other components that look like they might be, say, the mitochondria or other things? And, and so that also begs the question is what is the ultimate limit as to the, the, the actual uh, you know, T2 
levels you can measure with this technique and its optimal configuration? Yeah, so I'll answer uh, both ends of, of the question. You were asking about short T2 components. And generally, when you use an echo modulation curve, that uh, a, a echo, echo train length uh, with the echo time of 10 milliseconds, 20, 30, up to 150, you won't be able to see short T2 component. Like uh, we limit all of this analysis to half of the first TE. So anything below five milliseconds, we're saying this is invisible. We are not able to see it. We're not even going to try and fit it. And the same goes for T2 values that are above 200 milliseconds. Um, so um, there are a lot of uh, components that are just invisible, which means that we're not just looking indirectly, but also partially on the mile in water uh, uh, fraction. Um, one way to investigate these kind of systems is to use a preclinical scanner. In the 9.4 Tesla scanner, we can reach uh, as low as two, two and a half millisecond echo time, which, which means that we're sensitive to more components. Um, and uh, I can't really say where we're going next, whether clinical or preclinical, but, but you're saying something that is um, um, very central to all of this that the biology is so complicated and we're trying to simplify it so much. I mean, three components, components to describe a cell which contains a myriad, uh, so many different sub, sub, uh, sub cellular components is um, a bit presumptuous, but this is, this is uh, the limitation of, of using MRI today. So, um, we're, we're trying to get as much information as we can using these tools. Uh, great, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next question from uh, Chao Ma. Can you please unmute? Oh, hey, uh, thanks. That, that's the wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. So uh, my question is, uh, how does this uh, um, kind of uh, fast-spin echo-based approach compared to GRE-based approach? in the sense of the accuracy and the reproducibility of uh, mining water imaging? So GRE approach, and there are several, several approaches that are based on GRE, uh, is being used for mining water fractions. And I can't say that I've tested them myself, but I do, I can say that multi-spin echo protocols would be much more sensitive to changes in T2 than GRE-based approaches. GRE-based approach is first of all sensitive to T2 star, and the encoding quality is low, which means that your ability to differentiate T2 values that are close together, let's say 20 millisecond, 30 millisecond, would be impaired if you use the GRE sequence versus if you would use them, um, a, a spin echo experiment. So the, the advantage is just basic spin physics. Spin echo encodes T2 better. Yeah, I, I see, I, I think I understand that part. Um, I guess the question is, we're, if we're talking about the GRE-based approach, you know, as you said, it will be the T2 star model, right? So I, I guess the fundamental question is, uh, we all know that the T2 star has the components of T2 and this T2 prime, which is due to B0 in homogeneity. I guess the fundamental question is how well we can assume that the, the T2 prime is the same for both myelin water and the free water components. Is it the ultimate uh, uh, limitation of it? Can, can you repeat this? Um, so, so basically for the T2 star uh, model, we have yeah. two contributions. One is the inherent, the intrinsic T2. The other is the T2 prime, uh, right. uh, which is from B0 in homogeneity, right? So the underlying assumption of this uh, GRE-based approach or this T2 star-based approach for many water fraction imaging is that the T2 prime uh, components that not change for this many water components and the free water components. Is that true or? Mm, that, uh, if I understand your question correctly, it reminds me of a controversial debate I had about whether 
there is a magic angle effect inside the, in the water between mile and sheep. Is, it, is there susceptibility issues? Is this magic angle issues? Because some people measured uh, relaxation times in the brain, uh, once when the brain is like that and once when the brain is like that. And so changes and the question is, does it come from T2 prime? Does it come from magic angle? Um, I think that the, the water that, are, that reside between the myelin sheath do have different properties than the free water pool. Um, another work that we're doing now is looking at model of myelin, um, which is in vitro model of myelin. But I, I couldn't really say um, what, what happens on a GRE sequence, whether the T2 prime changes between, between the intra extracellular water and the myelin water. Mm. Yeah, well, thanks for your insight. Thank you. Great, so I think that concludes uh, this session. So Dr. Ben Eliezer, thank you so much for this great talk again, and we hope to have you next time in person. Thank you all, thank you for the invitation. Great, bye everyone.